Good morning. I'm Steve Friedman. I'm president of Pace University. Uh, Mr. Vice President, Governor Patterson, Deputy Secretary Wolin, other distinguished officials, it's a pleasure to welcome you and this impressive group of executives to Pace University and to our Lubin School of Business. The Lubin School has been educating successive generations of business and professional leaders in America for more than 100 years. And Neil Bianco, chair of our board of trustees and an alumnus of Lubin and I are delighted that you are all here with us this morning. It's an important part of PACE's mission to be a center of discussion and debate on the most important public policy issues of our time. And certainly those issues surrounding the revitalization of the economy and the Recovery Act are the most important issues of our time. This is a rare opportunity, I think, for the undergraduate and graduate business students who are with us today to witness public policy making in progress up close and personal. And this is a discussion I know that they will remember for, for some time to come. And it's important that they do so because it is they and their colleagues that are going to shape the future of this economy we are working so hard to protect now. So welcome to Pace University, and thank you for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, New York Governor David Patterson, Deputy Treasury Secretary Neil Wolin, and the Vice President of the United States, Joseph R. Biden. You can clap or something. <laughs> 
The governor is here. <laughs> In my state, to stand up for the governor. This is the governor. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you see, Mr. Vice President, most people worry about what they say when they're going to get to the lectern. I worry about whether or not I'm going to get to the lectern. <laughs> uh, I want to thank all of you for coming this morning to this Economic Senate, uh, Summit. I want to thank uh, all of the CEOs who have joined us, to President Steve Friedman right here at Pace, and to Dean Bosco of the uh, Lubin Business School, thank you so much for having us this morning. Uh, these are obviously difficult times, and we face uh, overwhelming, if not tragic, recession in our country right now. As governor, my priority is to try to maintain as many jobs as possible and put more New Yorkers back to work. Ultimately, uh, President Obama's uh, uh, economic recovery and reinvestment plan should bring 250,000 jobs to New York State. And realizing this potential will involve a great deal of efficiency and effective deployment of the stimulus dollars. Uh, we in New York, Mr. Vice President, are very aware of the fact that the federal government has very strict regulations for how the stimulus package should be implemented. We are aware that the states of Louisiana and Mississippi actually lost federal dollars even after the terrible hurricane in 2005, Hurricane Katrina, because they did not always follow the guidelines. And we are making sure that we are strictly adhering to what the federal policies are with respect to implementing the stimulus package. Uh, just last week, the Center on Budget priorities and budget policy uh, rated New York as being one of the best states in terms of implementing the stimulus money that we've received so far. We're very proud of the fact that we have already spent half of our Federal Highway Administration's resources to develop highways and have done that on May 29th, one month short of the deadline of June 29th. We already have crews at work repairing a bridge that connects uh, Highway 81 with uh, Bartell Road in Syracuse and a road that connects Albany and Del Mar at the state capitol. And we are putting more and more New Yorkers back to work. At the same time, when we do this, we are making sure that we are open and transparent in our process and using our website to make it easier for businesses to find the workers and for the unemployed to find places that might match up with their skills. We are trying to rebuild the infrastructure of this country as we have for the last 50, as we have neglected for the last 50 years, and doing it in a way that will uh, also enable us to bring some of the first high-speed rail to this country right here in New York State. We are aware, Mr. Vice President, of the administration's ambitious energy policy wanting to reduce carbon emissions by 80 percent by 2050. And we are doing it right here in New York, wanting to reduce, to convert 40, uh, our power by 45 percent to clean and renewable energy sources by 2015. And the stimulus money we have received, we are implementing immediately. Now, after next year, we are all aware that the stimulus money will end. And therefore, states are going to have to return to sole management over their budgets. And we are uh, trying to implement in Albany a spending cap whereby New York will live within its means, as New York citizens are forced to now, and a, uh, a legislation to reduce property taxes. New York has the highest property taxes in the country, 79% above the national average. And so, uh, as we look to the future, I was interesting, on May 4th, uh, I was reading that the laureate economist Paul Krugman warned of Japan-style deflation if we don't do anything in this country, even as Alan Meltzer, the known historian, warned of an inflation like it was in the 70s, both on the same page of the New York Times. So there may be a dispute as to what is the correct economic policy, but the two succeeding uh, uh, economists just in the last couple of weeks most agree that there are far more options as to how to solve inflation 
uh, than a long deflationary spiral, which is highly pernicious. And so I can't thank the Vice President enough for his effort on the uh, American recovery and, re and reinvestment uh, legislation that passed. As a former member of the Senate, he was steadfast and disciplined in helping not only to pass this legislation, but going around the country and soliciting all types of ideas as to how to implement it. So thank you very much, Mr. Vice President, for your work. And now it is my uh, pleasure to introduce the Deputy Secretary to the Department of Treasury, Neil Waller. Governor Patterson, thank you for that introduction. During these challenging times, our work with state and local officials could not be more important. And in you, Governor, the Obama administration has a very strong ally. On February 17th, President Obama signed into law the most sweeping economic recovery plan in our nation's history. The Recovery Act was a crucial step towards stabilizing the housing market, providing tax relief to small businesses, and giving economic assistance to state and local governments. Vice President Biden will shortly describe the administration's overall efforts to turn the economy around, and so I'd like to spend a few minutes highlighting now the work the Treasury has done in implementing the Recovery Act. First, through the new first-time homebuyer tax credit, Treasury is providing individuals and families purchasing their first house before December of this year with a credit of up to $8,000. The chairman of the National Association of Home Builders is with us today, Joe Robson. And Joe is a builder and developer from Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. And he says that this credit is not only spurring additional home sales across the nation, but importantly is helping builder and consumer confidence to rise. Second, Treasury moved quickly to allow small businesses to write off up to $250,000 in new equipment costs, while allowing all businesses to expense up to 50% of such purchases. These provisions save companies money while increasing demand for all sorts of items, from new copiers to new trucks. And we estimate that they have led to approximately $4.5 billion in tax relief for businesses. Third, the Recovery Act has lowered the borrowing costs of states and localities. Under the Build America Bonds program, states and local entities have already issued $10 billion of new bonds to repair schools, fix transportation facilities, and improve roads. Here in New York, the Metropolitan Transportation Authority issued $750 million of Build America Bonds, putting people back to work on transportation projects, and according to the authority, saving the MTA an estimated $46 million in borrowing costs. Fourth, we substantially expanded a program designed to support investments in low-income neighborhoods called the New Markets Tax Credits. Just last week, Secretary Geithner traveled to Roxbury, Massachusetts and announced New Markets Tax Credit Awards that will enable community development organizations in 33 states to invest $1.5 billion. Finally, we are implementing innovative ways for businesses and consumers to save money while in investing in energy efficiency. Due to the Recovery Act, homeowners can claim larger tax credits for installing alternative energy equipment like solar water heaters and wind turbines. They can also get a credit of 30% of the cost of home energy savings improvements, like adding insulation, energy efficient windows, and energy efficient heating and air conditioning systems. John Berger, also with us today, is founder and CEO of Standard Renewable Energy in Houston. His company provides comprehensive energy solutions for homeowners and businesses. John told us that in large part because of the steps taken in the Recovery Act, demand is increasing and his business is expanding. His workforce by year's end will grow over 70 percent, and just two months ago his company opened a new office in Phoenix. The Recovery Act, together with our efforts to stabilize our financial system, is starting to make a difference. The national economy is showing some initial signs of stability with confidence improving and credit starting to ease. Clearly, we still have a long way to go towards laying the foundation for a more sustainable recovery. But Americans should know that the President and the Vice President are absolutely committed to getting us there. In late February, when President Obama addressed the joint session of Congress, he announced that the Vice President was going to oversee the administration's implementation of the Recovery Act provisions because, as the President said, and I quote, Nobody messes with Joe, although just to be clear, I call him Mr. Vice President. In this role, Vice President Biden leads twice monthly Recovery Act cabinet meetings. He holds weekly calls with groups of governors, mayors, and county officials. And from a naval base in San Diego to a volunteer fire department in Pikesville, North Carolina, he is traveling the country to ensure that the Recovery Act is having a real impact 
and that taxpayer resources are well spent. Mr. Vice President, it is an honor to join you here today. And on behalf of all Americans, I thank you for your tireless commitment to ensuring that our economy not only recovers, but does so in a way that increases home ownership, promotes renewable energy, creates green jobs, and provides assistance to the Americans most in need of help. Mr. Vice President. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Gov, as an old saying goes, you forgot more about New York than I'm going to know, although I lived a while in upstate New York and went to Syracuse University. But uh, I can tell you, if there's one group of people who are not intimidated by nobody messes with Joe, it's New Yorkers. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, um, and uh, I want to thank the leaders, uh, the business leaders that have joined us here today with firsthand knowledge of how uh, our economy, our policies, and how it's affecting them, how, what impact it's having on the areas they're uh, involved in. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. Mr. President, thanks for the hospitality uh, and the students that are here. Welcome. I'm delighted you're able to be here, as well as the dean who, uh, as, uh, of the business school, is, uh, is very interested in what we're, uh, we're about to do. And uh, look, uh, uh, we came into office uh, a few months ago. Uh, um, and the economic climate, I think it's fair to say, was somewhat bleak. Um, this is the, uh, the deepest recession we've faced since the Great Depression, and it was getting deeper every day. Cases of credit, uh, a crisis in credit, as well as a crisis in confidence, an imploding uh, housing market, uh, job losses have been averaging about 600,000 more or more jobs a month, a feeling of uh, general uncertainty uh, um, and uh, a sinking feeling for average families all over America, all across this country, from big cities to small rural areas. So we acted. Quite frankly, we had no choice, no choice but to act. We confronted this crisis head on, and we did it by implementing a comprehensive strategy to stabilize the key sectors that are behind the downturn while investing deeply in trying to jumpstart jobs and investments, uh, particularly uh, um, not only in big cities, but also in rural Americas and small towns. And our strategy rested upon a few very important pillars, Gov. The first was a financial rescue plan to get banks back on sound footing so they could start lending again. That's a process. It's been a difficult process, but it's beginning to have an effect. And the plan was to stabilize the housing market, which isn't — we still have foreclosures. We know there are going to be more foreclosures, but we're trying to keep responsible homeowners in their homes and keeping mortgages affordable for middle-class people and first-time homebuyers, as we're going to hear a little bit from Joe. The budget uh, we submitted seeks to create a widespread long-term, long-lasting prosperity, making historic investments in health care, alternative energy, and education, while cutting the deficit in half. How many of you have said or heard people say, hey, Obama, Biden, why don't you just focus on getting us out of this recovery? I mean, getting us out of the economic mess we're in. Well, folks, tell me how we're going to lead the 21st century without a fundamental change in our energy policy. Tell me how we're going to do it with cost of premiums of health care escalating 54 percent over the last seven years without gaining control of that. Tell me how we're going to do it without revamping American education. We don't have a choice, in our view. That's why we submitted the robust budget we submitted. And, of course, we also came forward with what we're going to talk about today, the American Recovery and Re Re Reinvestment Act an initial big jolt uh, to give the economy a real head start. There's been some criticism we've not gotten enough money out so far. Well, look, since I was the guy put in charge of it, I want to make sure in these first 100 days we do it right. The one thing that could undermine this whole effort is if you had read stories the last 100 days about how this money was being wasted in the tens of billions of dollars. And you're going to see things start to really change in the second 100 days. Got $126 billion out. It's now going to take the governors and the county executives and the mayor a little bit of time. Why? Particularly infrastructure stuff, they're letting the contracts. Those contracts are now going to come back in. People are starting. We don't start to pay them until they start to pay, until they actually get things going here. You're going to see the next 100 days with some real pace on the ball, no pun intended. You're going to see this thing begin to move. 
And at least uh, one, the Recovery Act, is, as I said, the pillar we want to focus on today. The Act created, uh, um, it was created to serve uh, three specific purposes. The first and fundamental purpose, which kind of goes unnoticed, but has a difficult, the impact is difficult to measure with precision. But it was to provide badly needed relief to individuals and families who were devastated by this recession. As the Deputy Secretary mentioned, our Making Work Pay program gives up eight, gives 95 percent of the people in America an $800 uh, tax break. They're getting somewhere between around 60 bucks a month more in their paycheck, less withholding. Not a lot of people, that's not a lot of money, but guess what? Neighbors I come from, that makes a difference for people. We're also out there not only trying to help with their family budgets, but we're helping those who lost their job during this downturn by dramatically, as the governor can tell you, expanding unemployment insurance program, increasing the actual benefit by $100, expanding eligibility, also, also improving COBRA. That's the deal. All You all know what COBRA is, but the average American may not be aware of all these acronyms. It means being able to, when you lost your job, keep your insurance. We've been doing that by keeping uh, so that they can keep their health care insurance. And uh, so while families are unemployed, they're still able at a reduced cost to keep that insurance. And to provide for retirees. Retirees are getting slammed. They're particularly vulnerable during the recession. And we provided an extra payment of $250 to Social Security recipients and to veterans to help them weather this economic crisis. But guess what that means? That's a lot of money out there. That's hundreds of billions of dollars over the period of this act. That means they're going in and they're buying their groceries, they're buying shoes, they're getting their hair cut. They're actually doing things that put all that money back into the economy while helping themselves. The second fundamental goal of the act was to give a boost to the struggling states. And by the way, states have been hit by this worldwide recession. They've been hit very badly. They don't have the options the federal government has in this downturn. Twenty-three states, including New York, plus Puerto Rico, have qualified for education stabilization funds to help the states meet education costs and give them budget relief. You don't have to look too far to see the impact, because the Recovery Act impact right here in the city of New York was able to keep 14,000 New York public school teachers who otherwise would have lost their jobs on the payroll. Now, that's not just helping them keep their job. I don't know what the numbers are. I get the, the school could probably tell me. But the numbers are real. That means class size is not increasing by 10 or 20 or 30 percent, whatever the number is, relative to the number of teachers that would have been lost. It's a big deal. States also are benefiting from an increase in Medicaid funding. And that's the public health insurance, as you all know, but a lot of people who don't have Medicaid not sure what it is, particularly young people. It's for low-income families, which is even more necessary in hard times. It's billions of dollars. To date, the states have received $18.8 .8 billion to help up to 20 million more Americans get coverage that they now qualify for because they are poor, because they're in trouble, to keep the health care that is absolutely necessary for them. And the third goal of this Recovery Act is to make a major investment in projects that are going to create jobs that are going to build a foundation, a foundation for the 21st century. How many times have you heard the President say, and I think it's true, and I'm here with a, a bunch of very sophisticated business people, this next growth in our economy can't be built on another bubble. We've been through two of those bubbles, the dot-com bubble, and the housing bubble. We cannot lead the world in the 21st century unless we build a new foundation to be able to compete. And so this will not do it, but this makes down payments. As Secretary Wolin said, there's $4.5 billion in tax benefits for businesses, leverage to produce jobs. Already, state and local governments have issued over $10 billion in bonds to fix schools, roads, and transit facilities. The SBA has made $600 million in loans so far in the first 100 days. And here's the important part. That's not a lot of money. But of those $600 million in loans, there are over 600 small town banks who hadn't made a loan since 2007. 
or 2008 that are making a loan. It makes a difference in towns where first federal of, of uh, you know, Maquoka to Iowa is actually making a loan to be able to keep that local restaurant open, actually make a loan to keep that dress shop around. This is a big deal in a lot of places. And it's loosening, loosening credit because we're guaranteeing up to 90% some of those loans. In addition, we've approved more than approved so far, signed off on, more than 3,800 highways, roads, bridges, airport constructions, and repair projects in 53 different states. And we're not, you don't see that, the effect of that yet. That's the stuff that's being contracted out. The governor's going to have people out there laying this asphalt, pouring this concrete. I was up in northern Wisconsin at a bus factory. An awful lot of folks out there are taking their local money and the state money, and they're buying new buses or clean technology because we're focusing on it. It's employing an awful lot of people at a living wage, a wage they can live a middle-class life on. This has a ripple effect throughout the country. This isn't just about smoother pavement and new bridges. It's about State Hill Constructors, a New York construction company, who's able to rehire laid-off seasonal employees after winning contracts for some of the road projects the governor mentioned. It's about a highway in Illinois dotted with potholes being repaved by 120 new workers. And guess what? They're being paid a decent wage. They're being paid a decent wage. This is about middle class standards we are focusing on as well. It's about $1.5 to $2 million the contractor spent on that project. What does that affect? He had to go and buy more earth movers. He had to go out and buy more caterpillar pavers, profiling machines, rollers, other equipment. That keeps somebody hired at the caterpillar factory or someone not laid off, maybe even rehired. This is about the thousands, literally thousands of stories like this I've heard all, I haven't heard thousands, but I've heard scores of them all around the country. Shovels going into the ground, money going back into the economy, workers heading back to their jobs, even in the face of rising unemployment. We've also approved $2.9 billion in money, as I referenced by obliquely, from the, from, from the SBA. The administration loans uh, have supported a $4 billion in lending to small business. It's a leveraging impact. It's real. And so, look, where we are now is that we, uh, we uh, and we, we've already, we've already announced $38 billion in new spending to develop commercialized and renewable energy sources that will be the foundation for a new economy. I've been out there in the Midwest. They're, you know, a new windmill farm. Were it not for our investment in clean energy, though they, they wouldn't, wouldn't be building those 100 new windmills. So guess what I did? I went to a small factory that was around, hired the UAW work there. It means they get a decent wage. And guess what? They're the ones out there preparing the transformers for these operations. These have over 800 parts, 8,000 parts. We're trying to bring an industry here to the United States. Why in God's name when we're, and by the way, we, we announced a new windmill farm off the state of Delaware. New Jersey has from none to now four major petitions in. New York and a lot of other states all up and down this west coast. I mean, assume the east coast as well as the west coast. We're talking about spurring a new industry of renewable energy that's going to make a fundamental difference, not only in our climate, not only in our environment, but also in providing jobs that can't be exported. It sounds fancy, but, uh, but I've seen what it means uh, for real families and small businesses across the country. I saw at ABB Incorporated in Missouri, they, uh, they're, they're an electrical transformer factory. And because of a new wind farm project of 100 new wind windmills that couldn't have been funded without this act, new orders are up dramatically. They're able to keep people hired at us at, 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 a, at a decent wage. You're going to hear a little bit about this, but there's an outfit out in Chicago and to see if I don't mind mentioning a competitor here, one of our folks, Serious Windows in Chicago. 
where because of increased demand for high energy windows, they're able to sh reopen several shuttered factories, rehire some 200 workers that laid off for the previous manufacturer, and hire them in the multiple states. They went out and bought Republic. And it's happening here in New York, too. The New York State Veterans Home at St. Albans, Jamaica, New York, is installing more efficient motors, variable speed drive units, lighting, ballast, lighting sensors, daylight sensors, and replacing in incandescent bulbs with, uh, with compact fluorescent bulbs. All these things actually provide a job, decent jobs for people. They improve energy efficiency, reducing the cost of manning and running those facilities. They lower cost across the board and they lessen the impact of uh, energy uh, consumption on our environment. And here in New York, the Recovery Act is allowing the weatherization of public housing projects as it is all over the country. Not only are we lowering heating and cooling bills for vulnerable families, but in the process, we're leaving men and women with jobs from the projects. We're spending $500 million on retraining jobs. So our goal here is to get there are over 1.8 million young men and women in those projects qualified to do these jobs. We want to rehire them, hire them, and train them to do these weatherization jobs and give them a skill they can work with so end up having a permanent job. Look, we're trying to lay a foundation for a new century, not to uh, not make work jobs. And on top of all of that, I think we're helping the environment. Everywhere I go, I see with my own eyes, you know, like energy e efficiency and high-speed rail, relatively small amounts of recovery dollars will leverage very, very large investments in those areas. Folks, in all, we're building a, a secure and economic future. We're investing heavily today. We're going to build an economy for tomorrow. It's been a little more than 100 days since the President signed the act. and. Uh, and while uh, this is not the ultimate solution for our problems, we also know that it's a historic investment, an investment in the American people, an investment in uh, American business. We've obligated in the first 100 days $126 billion, $9.1 billion here in New York. We've created more than 150,000 jobs thus far, and we've helped more than 1,000 communities and tribes in every state and territory. And with some solid hints of stabilization in key markets, including housing, we may be starting to see some of the fruits of this investment. Most forecasters believe the GDP will turn positive by the end of this year, meaning recovery will soon replace recession. And vitally important, a recent survey has shown that consumer confidence is rising. Two-thirds of the respondents saying that the Recovery Act will help the overall economy, and half of them saying the act will help their personal financial situation. All said, our administration understands we have a long, long way to go and plenty of work left to do. We know the American economy will not fully uh, be up and running until we see robust uh, growth in jobs, decent jobs, providing working families with a stable and dependable income. And here is where we believe the Repo Recovery Act can have its greatest impact. The goal is to save 3.5 million jobs by the end of the year. By now, only 100-plus days in, people are at work in every single state in the nation who would not have been at work but for this act, and providing product that is worthwhile in and of itself. In the end, we know that recovery isn't just a compilation of statistics and whether the GDP is growing. It's a broad quilt stretching all across America designed to, for the sole purpose of making life better for communities and real working families everywhere. And the truth is, we're just getting started. We've just gotten out of the box. And we, we realize this act is only one piece of a major puzzle, but it's certainly an important piece. And what we've done so far is a real testament to America's vast capacity to create real progress in just over 100 days. And it gives me great hope that the next 100 days and beyond will even have more speed on it. We'll see more impact as we begin to spend out, the states spend out these monies. Oliver Wendell Holmes said, uh, the great thing in the world is not so much where you stand as in what direction you're moving. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're moving in the right direction. I want you to hear from this panel, and I want to hear from you. Thank you all for being here, particularly you, Governor. It's a great honor to share this podium with you. And so why don't we get started? Thank you all very much.
Let me uh, introduce very quickly uh, uh, the not-so-round roundtable we have here. Uh, Neil Suslack is, uh, um, ha has an energy venture operation. Steve Chen, uh, Crystal Windows and Doors sy System. Christian Zimmerman, Pike Industries. John Berger on my right uh, is uh, a Stand Renewable Energy. Uh, Francis Jamal or Jamal? Whatever you say. No, no, you, <laughs> you can call me Bidden if I mispronounce it. And uh, is, uh, um, is uh, from Rhode Island, and he has a, uh, uh, is it Jamal? Yes. Uh, Jamal's Shoe World. And Joe Robeson is uh, Robeson Company, uh, president of the National Home Builders Association. Now, if I get this right, um, I am supposed to uh, uh, turn to a couple of our participants here and ask them to make some opening statements. But did they tell you who I'm so <clears throat> supposed to turn to? Staff, who am I supposed to turn to? <laughs> well, I'm not going to turn to anyone then if they don't get going here. <laughs> I'm going to invite, uh, um, uh, I've got to look at the schedule here. I'm going to invite, why, why don't we uh, um, uh, start with you, uh, um, uh, Christian. Tell, tell us a little bit about your operation what you're doing and how this act has affected you. you okay. No, no problem. Uh, my name is Christian Zimmerman. I'm the president of Pike Industries. Pike operates a construction company. We make hot mix asphalt. Uh, we have quarries and sand and gravel uh, operations across uh, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Pike was established in 1872. Um, last August, uh, we were um, uh, looking at having to uh, lay off a significant number of people and uh, slash our, uh, our capital budget. Um, but uh, about a month later or so, I, I for the first time, heard um, uh, a leader in this country, President Obama, uh, or to, uh, uh, he was running for the presidency at the time, uh, say the word infrastructure. So we actually held off on laying off people. Uh, we made some investments, uh, bought a new asphalt plant for, for, uh, for our oper operation in Madison, New Hampshire. Um, and uh, when the act was uh, signed, um, our states uh, led the way in getting work out. And um, we uh, have been successful on 10 stimulus projects, um, uh, which has meant we've been able to uh, hire, at this point, 65 uh, people who have not worked at Pike before, and we have 70 other people in, in process right now. And we are working on, uh, I think, eight of those ten uh, projects um, as we speak, as long as the sun is shining back home. Um, and uh, for, for, for Pike, uh, it has uh, uh, been a huge impact. Uh, I would dare say that we probably would have had to lay off close to 150 people, if not more, this year. Um, so this is a, at least a 250-person uh, swing, that, that, that what the stimulus has done for our company. And Christian, what, tell me about the impact on some of your uh, subs. Uh, how are they? I mean, you know, you are directly employing uh, that many people or, in addition to not laying off, uh, what have, are, you, are you able to observe? And I'm not, if you don't know, don't ask. I'm just genuinely curious. Uh, the impact on your subs and, uh, you know, the people not directly in your employ? Um, most of the, of, the, uh, of the projects that we do require uh, subcontractors. We pretty much make the hot mix and we have paving crews that lay the hot mix. Um, but the striping, the guardrail, the curb, um, and a lot of other uh, uh, things that go along with building new roads or repairing roads um, are, are done by subcontractors. And uh, they certainly have benefited uh, uh, immensely from, from this uh, uh, stimulus plan, for sure. I, I don't know the numbers no, associated I, I with it, but I, I will tell you that it's, uh, uh, it's been a significant impact. I would assume, uh, Mr. Vice President, that you know, for Pike, about a 20 to 25 percent swing in employment, it probably is about the same across the board. And one of the criticisms that we hear sometimes, I hear sometimes, Zach, which, is, which I wanted to check out, is that the communities and counties with the highest unemployment uh, may not be getting the direct uh, investment as it relates to infrastructure. But uh, do if you're paving in one of your affluent counties or areas, um, are you hiring people from that affluent county or are you hiring people from other counties? 
Well, you know, people ask me a lot, well, how many people do you hire for this one job? You know, we, we pretty much hire people for our workload, and we hire them from um, around the states that we work in. Uh, you know, in our business, people uh, know that they have to travel uh, for work. So we may have uh, somebody from the north country of New Hampshire uh, working on a project in our biggest city of uh, Manchester, New Hampshire. We might have somebody who lives in Manchester, New Hampshire, working on a project in northern New Hampshire. The only point I want to make is that uh, one of the things, particularly in these construction projects, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's a not, not a whole lot of carpenters coming from uh, the most affluent neighborhoods uh, where, it's, where, 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 where the road may be going through, and not a whole lot of pavers uh, in there. So we are impacting on those counties with high unemployment. Uh, John Berger, tell me about your, uh, you know, here you are in Houston, Texas, and you're an energy efficiency company. Um, some people in New York think that's an oxymoron. I know it's not. <laughs> uh, talk about it for a minute. Tell me what you're doing. Certainly, certainly. Uh, it, it is, and uh, that was done on purpose uh, really to demonstrate, first of all, we have uh, a great number of uh, highly educated, highly skilled entrepreneurs in the city of Houston. But it uh, goes to your point that you made earlier, Mr. Vice President, the energy business is fundamentally changing and changing much faster than maybe even some of my friends in the oil and gas industry uh, think. Um, our company, Standard Renewable Energy, uh, our customers include homeowners, businesses, uh, restaurant chains, uh, and government uh, installations and buildings, military and civilian. Uh, we, uh, for our customers, lower their utility bills, lower their environmental footprint, and increase their energy supply reliability. So as we prepare for the hurricane season down in Florida and Texas, uh, we're seeing an increase in business. Um, we, we've had, uh, just to give you some employment numbers, I know you'll ask me, uh, about 18 months ago we had 35 people, uh, full-time full employees. Uh, when you were elected, sir, we, we had about 110, 115. Uh, we have 200 now, uh, and we have about 80 to 100 uh, part-time or subcontractors that work for us. Uh, we expect by the end of the year that we'll have 400 full-time and probably about two how, to three hundred. How, how has the act actually benefited you? Would you explain, um, you know, the you know how the tax credits may have affected your business? What what is it about the act? I mean, I think I know, but what is it about the act that allowed you to be in a position to go roughly from fewer than a hundred employees to uh, projected over four hundred employees? And expansion of offices. Yeah. You know, we, we just opened in Phoenix. We're now in Colorado, Arizona, Oklahoma, all of Texas, Florida, and Georgia. Uh, and uh, we're going to open up an office in San Antonio. Uh, just going to announce that this week. Uh, and it mainly goes back down to the, uh, the tax credits. Everything you mentioned earlier with the tax credits, with homeowners and energy efficiency, uh, it's amazing. Most people don't know that they have no insulation in their attic. And so when we go up there and we do an energy audit for a low price and show them what, how much thousands of dollars that they're, that they're just uh, letting literally go through the roof, uh, it's illuminating for them. And uh, they, they've spent money and they, to, to, because to save money. Uh, so the tax credits, uh, I would also say it's just the emphasis on it. it. There is a general sense that the energy business is fundamentally changing and changing quickly and there's opportunities for just the average person out there to save a tremendous amount of money, and that goes directly to what, you know, the talk is within uh, the economy uh, through a lot of what the stimulus bill brought forth. It brought, brought forth, I would like to say, and shown upon the truth. Uh, Neil, uh, you uh, um, have an uh, uh, energy venture company here in New York. Uh, tell me about what you're doing. Sure. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Vice President, and thank you, Governor Patterson, uh, uh, Deputy Secretary Wollin, and, and Pace University for hosting this event today. Uh, our uh, fund is a venture capital fund which invests in mostly early stage technologies of serving the energy markets. And for us, that's uh, companies that are looking at alternative energy, ways that we can produce power, fuel, uh, technology for transportation, for the next generation of technologies for those markets, as well as uh, technologies that go into existing resources uh, in cleaning them up, making them more efficient, and making them less costly. Um, our uh, companies generally uh, are funded at an early stage uh, by venture capitalists like ourselves, and hopefully 
will get to a stage where they've proven their technology, but the big gap, and this is where the Recovery Act really comes into play for us, is the next stage of having shown they've proven themselves as a technology scaling up to be able to produce that service or good uh, in the energy markets in an efficient way and uh, bring that cost down as they mass produce it. So the programs that are uh, geared towards uh, grants and uh, loan guarantees from the government are very effective, particularly today with capital being very scarce and scaling up these very, very large operations that these companies have to do to produce their product, whether it's a, an advanced battery that goes into hybrid electric vehicles or stabilizes the power grid or creates a fuel biorefinery from waste material as opposed to making fuel from petroleum products. These are very, very large-scale products and so and projects, that is. And so the capital that's uh, being stimulated by the catalyst uh, programs that the government is is uh, producing from the Recovery Act are very vital to these companies' success long term. Let me ask you this question. One of the things that, uh, that I've debated with folks about, and I'm not sure the answer, uh, is that um, something that, uh, um, that Christian said, that uh, um, the mere fact that we have as administration said, we're going to make a long-term commitment to alternative energy. That at least seems to me in and of itself to have an impact yeah. on which you talk a little bit about that, sure. if, if that's accurate. I'm not, we've no, not talked before. No, Mr. Vice yeah. President, that's, that's a very important point because um, the, uh, the uh, if you will, the, the broadcasting of that message to capital sources like ourselves, the venture capital community, which has driven uh, clean technology to become one of the leading areas of investment for venture capitalists around the country, and around the world for that matter, is very much driven by this uh, importance that the, this administration as well as governments around the world are attributing to new energy sources. So that's stimulating capital, that's stimulating entrepreneurs to go into businesses, start up companies in this area as distinct from software or biomedical uh, technologies that have historically been funded by venture capital. And it's also allowing uh, entrepreneurs to attract managers from very large companies to run these companies as they scale up. So government is a very important uh, force in uh, building this industry. And uh, it is a longer term uh, effect that it will have on job stimulus. But it's very important to start early because these businesses are very large. Quite frankly, I, I, was, I must tell you, I was surprised, particularly focusing the last month or so that I have on, uh, on, on wind energy, renewable energy. Yeah. And the largest uh, um, uh, manufacturer in the world has come here now. They yep. decided they want to invest here. Yep. Um, once they re realized we were serious about this, and it's amazing to me uh, the, uh, the catalytic impact, not a whole lot of money relative to the need, yes. um, has had on, um, on uh, more than startups. I mean, Plans are being dusted off. People are coming back with ideas. Uh, like I said, on the East Coast here, uh, the number of states that are now actually submitting to us significant plans for megawatts of electricity being generated. And it was only, you know, think about it, it was only a couple of years ago that the folks in the Nantucket Sound said, no, no windmills here. Um, and, uh, and now, you know, states are falling all over themselves, uh, which I think is good. But I assume it is, it is because of this leveraging effect. I, you know, I don't want to – look, what we're trying to do, what I'm trying to do for the president is make sure that this money is – we're accountable for it, it's transparent, and we don't exaggerate what it actually is doing, that we actually try to assess as rationally as we can what impact it has. But I think this is one of the harder things to measure, is what kind of catalytic impact it has on people. And you're in the business of making these bets. Um, and that, that's why I ask you the question. I appreciate it. Um, uh, Francis, uh, you, you had a uh, – your family had this shoe store in Rhode Island, Providence, for how many years? Yes, 75 uh, years? Uh, 75 years, yes. Tell exactly. me your story. Well, I think I'm up here. I'm the smallest guy here, but I'm representing all the mom and pop stores and businesses throughout the country. Um, my business, my father started the business, and we had 75, uh, 73 good years of business. The last two years, business slowed down. We closed a couple locations, 
and I went to my local bank to do some refinancing to keep the employees and to continue the tradition. And I was turned down by eight different banks, all bigger banks. One of them we were doing business with for over 30 years. And I tell you, I, I was very shocked and, and humbled, and I couldn't believe what was going on. And they actually told me, well, I'm sorry, just close your doors. And I actually had equity in the building and a game plan, and we've been doing this our whole lives. And, and, and people need shoes. And I told them, oh, I needed some money, some capital to keep going, we'll be all set. But they turned us down one after another. And I, you know, I, I wouldn't, did not want to give up. And finally, I, I went to a local credit union, and at that same time, the Recovery Act kicked into place where they guaranteed, the government guaranteed 90% of the loan I was looking for. Plus, on top of that, they waived the closing costs. So I saved about $14,000 on closing costs. Plus, the bank, the credit union, was very happy to loan us the money because they knew it would guarantee 90% from the government. And that money allowed me to continue, keep the business going, continue doing business, and now our sales have doubled. And people are coming back to the store and they're happy. The kids are getting shoes. And, and I know I'm just sort of a little piece in this, but if this is continued throughout the country, saving a small business will help this country build, build the ground, build, stay strong. To keep the little guy going, Mr. Vice President, and the country will go in the right direction. Well, I tell you what, uh, I, I, I'm not sure whether the Secretary wants to comment, but, you know, when I go around to uh, particularly uh, smaller states, smaller localities, uh, the one thing I hear the most is, you know, you're bailing out all the big banks up there, you know, uh, Mr. Vice President. Well, what about my bank here on Main Street? Um, you know, this is the place I've done business with for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and my credit is good, and I've never been behind in a payment. I've never, you know, I've never lost them a penny. I've just done nothing but make the money. And uh, you want to comment, well, Mr. Secretary, on how it's, uh, what banks or small banks are doing with this? I think, Mr. Vice President, this is a great example of how important it is for small businesses to be able to get access to credit and how the Recovery Act, both through a focus on these uh, Small Business Administration loan programs, but also by focusing on uh, the big banks and the banks across the, uh, the whole country, the first federals that the Vice President talked about, um, and, and really focusing on their lending to small businesses. And so we've um, heighten the transparency, an incredibly important part, not only of the Recovery Act, but of uh, the restoration of the financial sector, to make sure that we understand uh, that they're using uh, the Recovery Act authorities and these small business loan programs, but also some of the uh, assistance that we've given them uh, from the federal government to uh, make the kinds of loans uh, that, Francis, you're talking about. How, how many people do you employ, Francis? Uh, we employ 10 right now, and business, again, since we've got the stimulus money, business is starting to get better and back to school business, so we'll add a few more people. I just so think, you know, blocking and tackling bit by bit in these communities, uh, as the Vice President was talking about earlier, this is really, I think, an incredibly important focus of the act and of what we're trying to do. Plus, uh, excuse me, I was just going to say, the thing about the small business, too, which some people may forget, is we own property in small towns, and we own a big piece of property. So if I was to go out of business like the banks wanted, there'd be a vacant spot in a small town, unemployment again, it just steamrolls. So you really need to keep this money going in the right direction, get the banks to look at the little guys, because they can still make money on us. We're paying, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm going to ask the audience indulgence. I want to go through the two more folks, and I want to open this up uh, for people's comments or questions uh, to me or to anyone here in the panel. Joe. Uh, uh, you're president of the National Home Builders Association. You guys, uh, you know, there used to be a joke. I was raised by a guy in the automobile business, and in my neighborhood, the bad joke was the first kid to learn about what the word recession means is the son of an automobile man, and the first, last one to know what recovery means is the son of an automobile man. That, I think that could apply to home builders as well. Talk to me about what's going on and how the Recovery Act, as you see it from your perspective, um, has had an impact, if it has. Well, it has. Uh, you know, I think a lot of the economic indicators, frankly, right now look like we're either at or near a bottom in the uh, housing decline uh, as far as home sales are concerned. So I think a big part of that, uh, frankly, has been the housing tax credit. Um, we have testimonials from all over the country uh, where people have been able to uh, take advantage of really the, the most affordable uh, time period probably ever in the history of this country uh, to buy a home. Uh, 
uh, and being able to use the tax credit um, is, is certainly a vehicle uh, that's being used, and I think that's certainly one of the reasons why we're, we're, we're able to come out of it uh, or at least start seeing a, a bottom. Um, HUD Secretary uh, Sean Donovan last week uh, came to our board meeting uh, in Washington, D.C., and announced monetization to help uh, pay for some of the closing costs on FHA-insured homes. That is going to help tremendously um, uh, in, in furthering uh, the effects of the uh, housing tax credit. You know, nationally, we're looking probably at 200,000 additional incremental home sales, both new and existing home sales. Um, certainly, uh, that equates to some 73,000 from, from, from a job standpoint and new construction standpoint. That equates to some 73,000 new jobs. Um, certainly, that pales uh, in comparison to, to kind of what we've lost over the last few years since our our peak of three million jobs uh, since 2005, uh, but you got to start somewhere, uh, and that's certainly where we think it is. I, another part of the stimulus package was the uh, energy tax credits uh, on remodeling, uh, and those tax credits and, and some of the, the panelists here are, are certainly involved in that with uh, solar panels and energy and, and doors and windows, uh, but that's going to increase remodeling. Uh, some $3 billion over the next two years. So uh, it has certainly had a major impact, and, uh, uh, you know, it's great to see. Uh, well, uh, one, one of the testimonials is from your hometown in, in, in Wilmington, a nurse, Steve, uh, builder, Steen Bobberger, uh, was able to sell a nurse uh, uh, her first home. And uh, because of the tax credit, because of low mortgage rates, and because of uh, the price of housing. So... It's so all three of those things. It's not just uh, we're not claiming it's just the eight thousand dollar up to eight thousand dollar tax credit. Although that's a that's a nice chunk um, for a first time home buyer out there. But it's also the mortgage rates, which have gone up a little bit, uh, ticked up a little bit, right. but they're still pretty low. And uh, um, and uh, as well as uh, uh, the uh, what Sean is about to announce. Uh, um, so. Uh, well, thanks, Joe. I appreciate it. Uh, Steve, uh, tell us a little bit about crystal windows and door systems and, uh, and how, how there's any impact uh, um, for you through this legislation. Um, uh, crystal windows, like Francis is our company, we're also a family-owned operations. Um, we employ about 400 employees, uh, mostly manufacturing operators. Um, we're actually headquartered. Well, probably me and Neil are probably one of the few local guys here. We're, we're based right here in Queens, New York. Uh, we have a 225,000 square foot facility here in Queens. Um, we have operations also in Chicago, St. Louis, Cleveland, um, Allentown, and we just opened one up uh, recently in Connecticut. Um, last year, our product line consists of new construction and replacement vinyl and aluminum windows. Last year, when the new construction market started to um, slow down a bit, my new construction line, um, that facility just, it was a ghost town. We had... Um, we, we didn't have any orders coming in. Um, fortunately, I was able to switch some of the operators to move them into other parts of the factory to work. Um, during the slow season, um, December, January, when, it, when those months started to come in and, and with the constant news about um, the economy, how bad things were getting, um, in January we had a very difficult decision where we were planning to lay off about 100 employees. Um, our there were times where a lot of our uh, operators, they actually came up to me and volunteered to um, decrease their salaries, lower their pays, um, just to keep the entire team working. And uh, we have um, done some of that to try to stretch it out to February. And But literally within 24 hours after February 17th, once the Stimulus Act was passed, calls started coming in for energy efficient windows and um, we are, were able to offer all our products, um, all our vinyl products with energy efficient um, ratings on it and that following week after orders started coming in. Two weeks later we, our production was back up and running, machinery was running again. Um, we didn't have to, um, since as of last week we never had to lay off any of our employees. We're actually looking for production operators now and we're also hiring 
new engineers and new designers for um, our aluminum line to design, uh, redesign a lot of our products to, to be much more energy efficient. And the stimulus package has helped tremendously um, from our family business, from, from the employees that we were able to hire in. And uh, just to keep us busy and, and with the equipment that we have to buy, and not just for blue-collar workers, but also white-collar jobs where we also have to hire engineers and designers um, to keep our facility going and also reinvest into the future um, of, of our designs. Well, look, I thank you all. I, uh, I hope uh, the audience thought it was worthwhile to hear uh, each of these gentlemen whom I've each met for the first time. Um, but why don't I... Um, uh, open this up to the audience for any comments. If you'd identify yourself and then direct your question or make your comment, would you mind uh, giving them the microphone? And I appreciate you taking the time. <clears throat> Gentlemen, this is to be informal, so jump in if any of you have a comment. My name is Michael Sandberg, and I'm a faculty member at Lubin School of Business in the Finance Department. <clears throat> Mr. Vice President, you mentioned before that the retirees were be, being given $250. Uh, my question is, why wasn't this payment structured in a way which will be as an incentive to spend the $250, for example, as a coupon to give to retirees in which they have six months, for example, to spend the money? I would guess that giving them $250 would, would, uh, would bring about the uh, would bring the $250 to the savings bank, most of the retirees, because I don't think that most of the retirees are so poor that they will spend it. This well, most question. people on Social Security – well, anyway, let, let me uh, yield to the Secretary. I think, Professor, the, uh, the main goal was to provide um, this, this amount. People, some people are uh, choosing to spend it and have done so. Others will choose um, to replace uh, retirement accounts that they've – loss and they need in the future years. I think the desire was to, in the first instance, uh, let them make that choice, but to understand that an awful lot of that money uh, is being spent right now and will continue to be spent, but not to force uh, that in a circumstance in which an awful lot of retirees uh, had over the last year or 18 months um, had a, a significant uh, downturn in their, in their retirement savings. Uh, I, let me add one other thing, Professor. Um, there are a number of aspects of this Act that when we first drafted it, we, uh, this, this process began um, uh, back in, uh, in Chicago right after the election, during the transition. And uh, with uh, uh, Barack and myself and several key economic advisors, we yet had yet, yet to put the economic team together, um, uh, began to realize, like many of you did, uh, just how deep this recession was, just what we were inheriting. Um, uh, there, there, there was a joke actually made suggesting that uh, we bought in too high, um, that, uh, that people, uh, including us, did not realize just how tough a shape the economy was in and the world economy was in, although we knew it wasn't good. Um, and we began to put together the pillars, uh, you know, sort of the three pillars of economic recovery in credit, housing, and, uh, and stimulus. Um, and uh, when we finally presented the legislation to the Congress, uh, one of the tugs and pulls was whether or not this would spend out rapidly enough, how quickly we'd spend it out, what impact with a loss of probably $2 trillion just in these two years, the $787 billion was going to have. And uh, also, uh, there was discussion about whether or not um, it's spending out much too quickly might end up at the end of 18 months us hitting a cliff here, because we knew there would not be full recovery within 18 months, and we had one shot to get this through the Congress. And so the Congress made some changes. It made some changes in the allocation between the monies for states to governors instead of localities and so on. 
uh, and part of those changes related to uh, the, uh, the tax breaks uh, that went out. And one of the thoughts was not only were people going to, in, in the Congress, was not only were people, many people, many, a significant portion of, of those on Social Security are, in an, an inordinately large number, are relying on Social Security, period. And so we knew very well they are much more likely to spend it immediately or spend it out quickly. But the other piece was that it was viewed by some this wasn't so bad that this money may not be spent out all within the first month or two months or three months. Uh, that, that's been a constant tension uh, in terms of uh, the impact of the recovery and the argument. Theoretically, if you could take $787 billion and spend it all out in six months, you'd have a bigger bang for the buck in terms of stimulating the economy than you would. But if you look at the state of the states, you look at the state of the, of, of, of the economy, their likelihood of recovery and that having enough of a bang to move them all uh, in a position that needed to be was, was not likely. So there is a dynamic tension here. You'll find it, and I say this because others of you may raise it in other areas, not just in the direct impact. For example, you know, the make work pay. This is going to be paid out they're going to get this $800 over the period of a year. Some argued instead of just taking 60 bucks less out of their paycheck, because people will pay FICA tax. I mean, that's 95 percent of the American people. Why not just do it in one big push? The rationale was that it made more sense because of the nature of the need for this recovery to do it over a longer period of time. But it is a legitimate argument or disagreement, but you'll see it that tension exists throughout um, the entirety of, 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 of this legislation. Uh, gentleman behind you, the handkerchief in his pocket. Why don't you just stand in the middle, okay? Instead of, why don't you just stand right in the middle there? Then you have to run back and forth. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. My name is Pete Harkin. I'm a Westchester uh, legislator. I represent the second district, which is about 55 miles due north of here. Uh, and much of the drinking water of New York City comes from my district. And I say that because the stimulus has allowed us to get a jump start on some water quality improvement projects and wastewater projects, but it also highlights the investments that we haven't made over the last decades. And as you know, uh, when the Clean Water Act was first passed, the federal government funded 90 some odd percent of those types of projects, and the funding is now down to about 10 percent. So the stimulus has been very helpful in getting a jump start on that, but when the stimulus runs out, we're still looking in Westchester County, a billion dollars in water quality improvement projects according to New York State DEC, and that doesn't include the $200 million just in my district alone for stormwater retrofits, and that all comes out of property taxes. And since we're talking about supporting the middle class, we know property taxes are an aggressive tax on the middle class. So my question is, do you have plans to sustain long-term funding and increase funding for uh, wastewater projects and water quality improvement projects? Well, first of all, Representative, thank you for being here. I realize this is a bit of a busman's holiday for you. But thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, uh, what you say uh, uh, is absolutely accurate. By the way, for less prosperous counties than Westchester County, for relatively small towns uh, um, in, uh, you know, 10 to 30,000 people. They have the same stormwater problems. They have the same problem of, and just for you students who may or may not know, you know, what happens is this stormwater, if you don't, if you're not able to take care of it, it goes into the sewer system, overflows the sewer system. You have, there's all kind, and it's incredibly expensive incredibly expensive. So you have a small town like Keokuk, Iowa, I think they had to invest uh, in order to deal with their problem. They're talking about uh, something like $22 million. I don't forget the number, big number, which they couldn't possibly um, actually do. Um, and so it raises the question, which is um, uh, perennial, and that is on those issues relating to the environment and public safety where the federal government has come in in the past and provided funding, like for the COPS 
uh, funding, like for the burn grants, things like that, which is in the act as well, um, the communities are saying, hey, Joe, um, we, we, we don't want you going away. Um, and, uh, and what everybody has to understand is that we are not making a fundamental shift in the responsibility to deal with local problems, saying the federal government will now be the outfit that is going to come along and see to it you don't need to have property taxes as high as you have them. Um, the reason we're along right now is because we know the distress the states and the counties are in terms of loss of income. If I'm not mistaken, New Jersey is going to lose somewhere because of the impact of the economy, particularly New York City's impact upon the portion of New Jersey where a lot of folks uh, who work in New York City live. It's something like 30, 40 percent of their budget. Um, so this is not intended to be, not intended to be, uh, federal, permanent federal responsibility for quintessentially local um, functions. Um, but there are two areas where we think, and it will affect you as a local legislator or as a, a uh, um, I know you're a state legislator, but I mean from the impact on your locality, as it will the councilmen and the county executives, et cetera. And that is on the environment and on, on, uh, on, on public safety. Um, for example, uh, we think that we should have the federal government more engaged in dealing with the overall environmental problems, including moving closer to what were the elements of the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act that existed in the past. We're coming up with that. If you take a look at our budget for the first budget we submitted, there is more help in those areas. Uh, law enforcement, similarly. We have in this, uh, our first budget we submitted, 50,000 more cops. But again, it is not a permanent commitment to maintain your local law enforcement. It is to uh, jumpstart your effort, maintain our effort as when I wrote the COPS bill initially for three of the five years, eventually the community having to take over responsibility, particularly in light of the hope that as economic recovery occurs throughout the nation, your state and local coffers are going to change, everything changes. Uh, but um, I wish I could tell you, Representative, that uh, you can count on the same degree of funding for um, uh, um, water projects, which are incredibly expensive, existing at the same level uh, ad infinitum. Uh, it's not going to happen, but hopefully it will be more. Sir, all the way in the back there. Deputy Chief of Staff to Congressman Charles Rangel. Welcome back to New York. Hey, he's got the money now, man. We're coming to you. I, I'm glad you're want, here to answer these questions. Thank you. Um, <laughs> we're having two very important meetings this week in our office on Wednesday and Thursday. One with the small business advocacy groups to talk about how to use the Recovery Act to stop the hemorrhage of small business closures by also helping to reduce their energy and health care costs. Our second meeting is with the banking institutions within our congressional district to get them to provide more loans to small businesses. We've had a problem with our institutions not being so um, eager to do that. And my question to you is how can you help us leverage those banking institutions? What message can you help us tell them that, that would inspire them to give more loans without putting a gun to their head? Well, um, without injecting fear, I'm not sure uh, what, but I'm, I'm going to yield in a second to the Secretary to answer the second part of the question. Let me speak to the first part. Um, uh, much of what we have in the Recovery Act, again, is designed to not only give immediate relief and help and to spur economic growth as a part of uh, a piece of this engine, one of the legs of the stool. But it's also, if you notice, on the energy section of the legislation, as well as the health care piece of, of this legislation, there is assistance available, 
plus the SBA loans that are made available, and there's what, three billion, is that what the number is? Um, uh, for small bid business to be able to stay in business, reduce their energy cost, just getting energy audits and, and so on, as well as, as well, well as health care help. But you know better than I do that the President has proposed, we have proposed, a major new health care piece of legislation. We've made a down payment of $635 billion over 10 years in our budget on how to get us there. That's the part where people say, hey, Joe, what are you doing? You can't afford to spend it over 10 years. We're in economic difficulty. Our response is there's no way to bend that curve of health care costs, which is moving exponentially for us in terms of our budget, unless we change and reduce health care costs by building in a whole range of savings we're talking about building in and making businesses, small and big, more competitive. I might say to the, to the dean and others here in the, the business school, I don't have labor guys coming to me saying, hey, we need a major change in our health care policy. I have businesses coming to me. I have the Fortune 500 companies, the business roundtable. These are the guys saying, hey, I can't compete. I can't compete internationally when, with a system like this, with the cost that I'm bearing. And I have no option in terms of dropping health care. And so um, Charlie can answer the second part better than I can. We know where we stand. We know that, that, uh, that the chairman is leading the charge for health care. Um, but we got to figure out how we pay for the remaining. We laid out how we pay for the $635 billion. It's probably going to cost over 10 years closer to a trillion to a trillion two, depending on what the package is. And so we got to figure out how to do that piece. But that's where in, uh, within the act, and we'd be happy to uh, literally have some of our staff um, uh, confer with you and, and, and the chairman's staff before you have this meeting with small businesses. There's a lot of things in this legislation we can do to help them with health care costs, help them with, just in this legislation, help them with energy costs, and help them with investments in need for loans for inventory as well as expansion or just maintaining their existing franchise. Um, but why don't I uh, turn to the Secretary to speak to what is a very difficult issue, and that is big banks making loans to small businesses. So I think uh, there, uh, Jeffrey, two things really that I would point to. One is as part of the transparency that we're trying to bring to the government's assistance with respect to the big banks and how they're using that assistance, we have just in the last month be, uh, begun their reporting on how much they're lending out to small businesses. And that, that element of transparency, which we put on our website, um, we think is important to sort of spurring them on to do what um, is important for them to do, which is not only to use uh, these funds generally uh, to, uh, you know, increase the flow of credit to jumpstart the economy broadly, but also in particular, as we were discussing with Francis, uh, in respect of small businesses. The second thing is that we have uh, a facility that we started as part of our consumer and business lending initiative that targets $15 billion uh, at purchasing securities that are backed by SBA loans. And the point there is to get these institutions to sort of unstick the flow of credit to small businesses through these institutions and more broadly within the financial system to, again, uh, get that, uh, that credit flowing. And the, th the third thing, actually, I'd mention a third thing, which is not really about these bigger financial institutions, but just in the last few weeks, Secretary Geithner has announced that we are reopening the, the uh, assistance, the, the uh, capital assistance that we've made available um, over the last months, again, to small banks, uh, so that that source, that natural source of lending to small businesses can, again, uh, to the extent that they want to access uh, that assistance um, and allow themselves to um, get that credit flowing again to small businesses, they have that opportunity. So those are three pieces, I think, of the answer, uh, but absolutely very incredibly important issue. Look, uh, you know, I just re realized, I wish I had some staff here with me. 
uh, to tell me my timing, but I just realized, uh, Mr. President, I'm really trespassing on your time. I was supposed to, we were, we were supposed to be out of here at 12.35, um, and it is uh, uh, 10 minutes of one. I apologize for my enthusiasm relating to this legislation. Um, and, uh, but um, uh, I, I just think that, uh, you know, it's important people know, uh, again, being transparent, what we're trying to do, what we are doing, what's not happening. Well, what I'd like to do is I'd, I'd invite, or any of the students have, that are here ha have a question. I promise this will be the last question, and then we'll ask any of you guys who want to make a closing comment. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. I'm a, I'm, a student, I'm a sophomore here at Pace University, and uh, I'm a resident in the state of New Jersey. And my question is, who is responsible to monitor the spending of stimulus monies given to the state that comes from a direct application by a small government entity? For example, say that the New Jersey Public Housing Authority applies for funding, and the funding is given directly to them and doesn't pass through a state government entity. Is the state government responsible to determine that the funds were spent as they were intended to be spent, who is responsible for monitoring that spending? Thank you. Me. Uh, <laughs> that's the very bad news. <laughs> that's the very, very bad news. That's why I am so fastidious. I, uh, the President gave me authority to convene a cabinet meeting once a week, um, and, uh, and I think that my uh, colleagues in the cabinet thought that that was just hortatory. I convene one every week, um, and they show up uh, because I want to know exactly what's going on. Look, you ask a really important question. First of all, we have a website that is getting better and better. We will, by the September, have a website, God willing, you'll be able to go on to, anyone, the public at large and be able to determine, and we think this will get down literally to um, uh, congressional district and then cities within congressional districts, exactly how much recovery money went into that area for what, so people can become our eyes and ears and find out that, you know, we we're supposed to be repairing that bridge for three million bucks over a creek between Harrisburg and a small town that separates two towns, and we haven't seen anybody out there working for the last, uh, you know, three weeks, uh, um, I mean, in a literal sense. We also, so we're looking for the public and the press is looking at it too, and for us to monitor whether or not the monies were actually being sent out, are they actually being spent the way, uh, and this is unprecedented. We've never, there's never been an attempt to do this, to lay out exactly where the money's going, not only to whom, but geographically and the locale it's going into. Um, the governors have a legitimate concern that some of the money that's going into their states, they do not historically directly control, but they're going to have to report on. For example, there is education monies that go out. There's $104 billion in this act uh, under the authority of Secretary Duncan, who's a real superstar, by the way. This guy is really good, a young man. Uh, um, along with Sean Donovan, many of you in New York know from his days in the Housing Authority here. Um, uh, and uh, um, it depends on the state. Some governors control the school districts. Some mayors control them, some are independent school boards, and then there's also competitor grants that are going out that are going to go out to um, local operations that historically have been involved in community development but are really sort of free agents out there. And so what's got the governors concerned is that they are going to be held accountable. We're asking them. We're asking them to try to follow the money with us as well. But we have auditors. We have a group, uh, and uh, Ed DeSev is here, who we've hired on as the CEO of this operation. But we have a board of 10 um, uh, uh, auditors general who are in the, at the federal level who are working with the auditors throughout the country, the state auditors, as well as with the auditors in local, local municipalities, trying to see to it for the we are going to able to follow the money. We're holding the individual, individual institution accountable, 
that we get the money to, but we're also asking state and local governments to take on the responsibility, depending on what, what, what pot it falls into, to account for that money as well, knowing that they are not directly responsible for its expenditure. So, and it makes up a relatively small portion of the $787 billion, but it's nonetheless very important, and we know we're going to be judged. We know we're going to be judged whether or not for the first time ever the federal government has followed the dollars on every penny of this money being spent. I'll conclude by saying a very, uh, a very competent national columnist, Gail Collins, when this program was introduced and they were sitting in the vice president's office with me with five or seven leading columnists in the country, when we announced the act and that I was, had been put in charge of it, she said, um, she said, Mr. Vice President, what's going to happen, I think this was a quote, or it's paraphrasing, it's awful close, so what's going to happen, Mr. Vice President, when you plant 10 dead trees in Central Park? I said, it means we're going to have to plant 100 good trees in Fairmont Park in Philadelphia. <laughs> we have no illusions that we are going to, there's going to be mistakes made. We already have the auditors general, the, uh, the inspector generals, 10 of them on the board that we have, national board we have. We are the have them setting out guidelines because people are being scammed already. There are these scam artists out there, you know, sending people applications. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that we know is going to go on. And we know some of this money is going to be wasted. And as I said to, um, uh, the guy who heads this whole operation, one of the most respected inspector generals in the government, um, I said to Earl, I said, look, um, your job for me, and he doesn't answer to me directly now, he got hired by me, or by the president, and they're independent, is to let me know when you find fraud or abuse or waste before anybody else knows so I can announce it. And his response was, that's a novel idea. A novel idea that the federal official would want to announce where money is being wasted. This is about credibility. This is about accountability. This is about transparency. Because we've never asked the Congress, the country has never ever invested this much money in a program that is beyond the yearly budget. And we know that our credibility depends on this being done well. So we're attacking it from as many angles as we can, even though the governors say to me, and I have a weekly, and I'll end with this, I have a weekly meeting on the telephone for 45 minutes to an hour with somewhere between six and eight governors every week. I've now covered, I think, all 50 governors, as well as twice the number of mayors, big cities and small. And my message to them is the same and theirs to me. Hey, Joe, we can't be responsible. And my answer is, you're going to be responsible. We're all in this deal. So even though where there's not direct, immediate responsibility, we're still asking for help from the localities in trying to determine. But it's our responsibility. Ultimately, it ends up on my watch. Um, and, uh, um, and that's why I am so keenly interested. Uh, in this money being spent the right way. Uh, let me ask any panel member that would like to make a closing comment. Uh, yes. Say, Mr. Vice President, um, I think that you mentioned this earlier in your, in your speech before, and it is the quintessential question that uh, myself and the rest of the employees ask at Standard Renewable Energy, is what is going to keep this economy going after the stimulus money has been invested? And uh, the resounding, and I can tell you that from the data that we've seen with the growth, uh, the uh, exponential growth of customers, the price of solar panels, uh, and therefore solar for the average American, uh, I decreased price six weeks ago, 26 percent, before I got on the plane to come see you and, Ms. and the secretary, decreased price again, 13 percent. There is a discussion about whether the green jobs are myth whether that all this after the stimulus money goes away with regards to the green new energy economy, uh, I can tell you with absolute certainty it is not a myth and it is taking hold and it's going to create millions of jobs in the years to come. 
the platform is being created. Well, thank you very much. I, at least that, that is our objective. Folks, thank you so much for taking so much time. Mr. President, thank you very much for allowing us this time. Thank you very much. Thanks, folks.